I love sports, but you gotta play the game that's right for you. Same with computer and video game. Every game box has a rating symbol that suggests what age the game is back. See, you gotta play the game that's right for you. Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. It is I, Game Metal Gaming. Today we are diving back into another iceberg and this one comes from icebergcharts.com. So you know it's not from an idiot like me. Video games tend to deliver what their ESRB rating advertises. You know, if it's a rated E for every one game, chances are you aren't going to be seeing any of this nope. in it. But sometimes, whether purposeful or not, some things seem to slip through the cracks and we get disturbing stuff like this in a game that is usually all sunshines and rainbows. There's a lot of this throughout gaming history and today I want to break down the disturbing things found in family friendly video games iceberg. I'm going to be skipping more of the well known obvious stuff in the early layers and I will actually be combining layers for the sake of the structure of the video. I wonder what kind of stuff we'll see when we pull back this foil lid on this baked goodness of creepiness and disturbing content. Come here little Jimmy get your slice of E-rated lasagna. Guess what's in it? Your fucking nightmares. Majora's Mask has eluded me for quite a while and I've never taken the time to beat it, however I do know the game and its infamy. At least in terms of the darker tone it took on for the series, and this tone is nowhere more present than in the ending of the game. Well, at least the ending if you don't do what you need to do in the allotted time given. If you let the 72 hours run out without playing the Song of Time, the game's game over will play out, which is known as the Terminum Apocalypse. This is where that big scary moon f in the sky will finally crash down into the clock tower in the middle of Terminus, sending a devastating shockwave throughout all of the surrounding areas, turning everything it hits into fiery ash. Sounds familiar, huh? I'm sure this isn't a reference to anything that only happened 55 years before the game's release. Totally not. Anyway, this is a pretty dark Zelda game. Gotta be up there with one of the most disturbing endings. Most likely the most dark ending for a Zelda game. I'm not super familiar with all the games in the series, so maybe in one Link commits war crimes or something? I don't know, to me it seems like the darkest ending in a Zelda game though. Luckily, after the disaster event occurs, the game will simply reset to the previous time he played the Song of Time, and all progress is reset to that point. Yeah, I don't know about you guys, but I'd rather, you know, sit down and chat with Resetti or look at beat up and bruised Donkey Kong for the rest of the time than experience this as a kid back in the day. Listen, Kirby's the epitome of just happy ha-ha land video game feelings, you know? Usually if you pick up a Kirby game, you're looking for a good platformer that won't present a huge challenge, especially if you're picking up one of the more recent ones. However, even something as bright and colorful as Kirby has its own dark shadowy corners, and some of those can be seen in the designs of certain enemies. Most of the enemies that litter Dreamland and other areas are usually puffy and cute like Kirby himself. However, some just come off as straight up disturbing. These disturbing designs even made their way into bosses, and it's especially present in Kirby's Dream Land 3 on Super Nintendo. The final boss of the game is thought to be this Dark Matter enemy in a larger boss form, but upon defeating that enemy, the true final boss known as Zero comes out. Both of these designs are pretty eerie as it takes on this huge singular eye aesthetic that can be found littered throughout the Kirby universe. I don't know if there's a specific phobia for huge eyes or not. It kind of reminds me of that scene in Suicide Squad with a giant starfish. Yeah, where they kind of bust into homeboy's eyes. Ugh. Anyway, this boss is known as Zero is the ruler of the Dark Matter enemies and just straight up starts spawning them and using them as ammo against Kirby. Yeah, that's right, the guy you just fought off thinking was the final boss is now the true final boss's attack. Get fucked, idiot. Would you think this was Kitty Kitty Stupid World, huh? Oh, oh, but you're thinking this is Kirby, this is Kirby, it's Happy Dreamland, right? You just got hustled, idiot. Where's Uncle Phil at? Uncle Phil in your ass. To make matters worse, halfway through fighting Zero, his eye will just straight up burst out of the rest of his body as a last ditch effort. And man, it's pretty gruesome for a Kirby game. I know that's technically probably not blood and eye guts and whatever, but damn, if it doesn't feel like it is. It's definitely a really cool moment and it adds to the final fight, but you can't say this guy in this boss fight isn't a little creepy.
Super Mario 64 at this point should be called disturbing content that doesn't actually exist 64. I'd argue the overall aura of the game is off and a bit eerie. This is likely due to the same emotions I get from seeing liminal images or something, but it's still present and, and I'm aware of it. There are more obvious examples too, like the deep dark Bowser laugh that greets Mario at the entrance when he first walks in the castle. <laughs> Or how about the obvious eel and piano enemies that everybody's afraid of? How about some of the paintings that surround the castle? The Bowser one is pretty creepy, especially considering that it's basically jump scaring you on your way to the first fight with the However, an even creepier example lies in the basement of the castle. I already hate basements for obvious reasons, but especially in Peach's castle, man. In a place that is already huge and definitely eerie, the basement is the last place I want to be. Luckily though, the basement isn't your classic creepy basement, but it does have some creepy winding hallways. And at the end of one of these hallways is a creepy image waiting to scare unaware players. I actually remember the first time I turned this corner and saw this painting for Lethal Lava Land. I think I threw myself out of my second story window hoping to crack my own neck. And I played this shit when I was five. Anyway, this painting is definitely the creepiest painting in the game in my opinion, and it fits the level for sure. But what the fuck is this face in the fire? Dude, I was looking for faces and fires anytime I went camping or some shit for years after this. It obviously isn't that creepy nowadays, but for someone who is just stumbling upon it for the first time, it can be pretty shocking and uh, kinda eerie, bro. We've all heard of the Red Ring of Death on the Xbox 360s, right? That was a hardware error where the Xbox would basically brick and the only indication of life left in the system would be a red glowing ring that would surround the power button. It was feared by many players, but if we kick it back to a generation beforehand, there was something even more disturbing happening on the PlayStation 2. Ooh. If you were to insert a disc that could not be read, the PS2 would boot up into a unique screen in which it would tell you to insert a format disc. This doesn't seem all that disturbing, but when we start to dissect the screen, we can easily see why some gamers describe it as one of the most terrifying experiences of their childhood. Now listen, I never had a PS2 growing up, I was a GameCube kid, but I know all too well the shame and anger that came towards having a game that was too scratched and fucked up to be read by the game system. These screens always suck to see, no matter what system you're playing on. It usually means something is wrong with your disc, or the disc isn't compatible with the system you're playing on. Either way, these fucking suck to see. Therefore, when Sony decided to add in a little extra zest, a little extra ambiance to their RSOD screen, people seem to have remembered. And let me tell you, they'll never forget. The screen takes players away from the somber calm boot screen and replaces it with a red shaded background while ambient acoustics play in the background. However, something about the background noise and the fact that this feels like you fucked up trying to put in a disc that won't work made this screen come off as disturbing for many. I think it's a time and place thing. Obviously, if I go scratch my 17th copy of Jack and Daxter and try to play it and see the screen, you know, I'm not gonna be shitting myself out of fear or anything. But I can kind of see what this comment is saying. If you were young enough, and it was late enough at night, you know, I could see this unsettling me to my core. Ooh, I saw the red screen of death on PS2. I might not sleep ever again. The Game Boy Camera was an accessory that was pretty impressive for the time. Releasing in the late 90s, the accessory would allow players to use their Game Boy as a camera. No shit, right? And even print the images off into real life images. Obviously, this isn't anything impressive nowadays since you can make every picture look like it was taken in heaven with a phone from like five years ago. However, back in the day, this was a really cool little gimmick thing that added to the Game Boy's illustrious history. The camera came with an app, and within the app it allowed you to take pictures, obviously, but it also came with a few minigames and a bunch of small easter eggs and stuff. One of these small easter eggs was located in the shoot menu of the game. If you go to this menu, a mock RPG player choice menu will pop up and you have a typical settings you would in RPG like items, magic, and even a run button. Run buttons in RPGs, you know, they're usually used to escape an encounter a player doesn't want to be in. This is rather popular in the Pokemon series and to see it referenced here is pretty cool. However, when you click the run button, it takes players to a weird screen depicting what looks like the continent of Africa. This image seems pretty harmless, but if you keep spam clicking run, eventually a choice few disturbing images will start to appear. I enjoy destroying lives. It will show a series of images of Nintendo employees in which they have drawn silly faces on their photographs. However, this is accompanied with the eerie text that reads, what are you running from? 
This made players very uncomfortable with viewing the Easter egg. And I can't fucking blame them. Look at this shit. This just seems like an addition from the developers who use these images to test the camera software. In reality, viewing these low quality images along with the chiptune music and the eerie message, it really makes for one of Nintendo's most disturbing secrets. This was definitely added with good intentions, but it has become infamous because so many people had unlocked the core memory much later in life and found it much too disturbing. Have you seen this Nintendo employee in your dreams? You're not alone. Call this number. I'm not super familiar with the Taiko no Tazujin games. They seem like a form of Donkey Konga, and it's obviously outlived that series and dominated the market as one of the only drum-based rhythm games, I think. The games are usually known for their upbeat, you know, pun intended, nature and overall light-hearted aura. However, in the Taiko no Tazujin Wii 2, there is a disturbing secret hidden within the game's files. There is a total of 70 songs in the game, but there is technically another unplayable song located in the game's files. However, I don't know if anyone would really want to play this song, as it's one of the most jumbled up, eerie songs I've ever heard in a video game. It starts with a dull sound of footsteps followed by screaming, and a rendition of Wrath of Requiem. I'll play a quick snippet right here so you have a better idea of what we're dealing with here. Yeah, pretty unnerving, right? And definitely out of place for a game that looks like this. While some players believe this is some sort of satanic song that devs hid within the game's files, you know, to have a little drum off with Satan like Guitar Hero 3. In reality, it was an easter egg that was just likely included to tease at a future entry into the series. This was only meant to reward those who did the work to uncover the file as it was buried very deep within the game's files. The file is only referred to as 1STPAI, and there is no reference or explanation other than the name. We are left to speculate just what this song is doing here. But man, if it doesn't go hard right around this part. <laughs> Yoshi's Crafted World is one of my least favorite Yoshi games. Ha, I said it. Hey, at least it's not new Yoshi's Island, right? But yeah, in the ranking of Yoshi games, this thing is definitely as close to being F without being there, so probably a D. The game has a lot of issues like the difficulty, theming, and even music, which is just pathetic for a Yoshi game. I much prefer me a Wooly World if I'm playing a modern Yoshi game, but the gameplay was at least still there for Crafted World. Most of the game is the light-hearted Yoshi platforming you could come to expect from a Yoshi game at this point. Well, at least until you get into the later part of the game. At some point, you will close in on the final few levels of the game and come across a level known as Be Afraid of the Dark. This level tasks Yoshi with walking through a desolate town where most of the enemies are axe-wielding clowns. This level is also one of the hardest in the game, as these enemies can basically two-shot Yoshi. One swipe from these clowns will cut your hearts right in half, so you really want to just try to avoid these guys. This ends up turning this level into a terrifying kind of stealth mission through a desolate abandoned Gotham where, you know, Joker won and killed Batman and sent out his axe-wielding Joker minions to kill anything roaming the streets. Alright, maybe it's not that bad, but the difficulty spike and the theming of the level makes some feel like it's kind of out of place for the game. Listen, I'll always take the added difficulty, especially in these types of games. I saw a post that compared this level to the stop and go station in Donkey Kong Country, and I actually think it's a great comparison. If you look at the level as a stealth level, it can actually make you squirm a little bit whenever you run across one of these clowns, because there are segments where you'll have to get into their direct line of sight and dodge them, kind of. It also doesn't help that the music and atmosphere around the level is just kind of eerie, especially for a Yoshi game. <laughs> I would love to see a full-on horror game by Nintendo, but, you know, leaning into the weirdness of this level and other easter eggs we've seen thus far, that'd be so cool.
Luigi's Mansion is one of my favorite games in Nintendo's vast library. It's a unique game that has had a couple sequels, but I feel like the magic of the first one still hasn't been recreated in the newer ones. Luigi's Mansion 3 felt more like a step in the right direction, but maybe I just have nostalgia tinted glasses on whenever I see the first game. The first Luigi's Mansion was the first of its kind when it came out, so it felt very unpredictable. At that point, we knew about a loose Mario formula, you know, even for 3D Mario games. So when Luigi's Mansion came out and you couldn't jump and knew some shit was about to get fucked up, boom, you're in the mansion for one night playing Ghostbusters as you hunt down not only your brother Mario, but all the ghosts plaguing the house. And it doesn't hurt that you get some cashola, some casserola along the way. One of the most jarring things in the game is the blackout, which happens after you beat the third boss in the game, Bulasis. After you complete the boss, you are then tasked with climbing all the way back up to the roof after Egad rips you away to get the blue Asus painting from Luigi. You know, he's got to get his greasy fingers on that immediately. Then you use the key that will then open the locked door in the Blossus area, except when you attempt to open the door, a lightning bolt will strike the mansion, sending everything into a pitch black frenzy. This, of course, means that all of your progress thus far is reset. Well, at least in regards to turning on lights in rooms, anyway. Due to power being out, you can no longer be safe in a room without multiple ghosts spawning and, you know, wrecking your shit. The only way to fix this is to visit the basement and flip the breaker back on. So, here we go walk all the way back down to the basement you stupid asshole you thought this game didn't have fluff in it you got you got yourself wrong buddy this this walk is one of the most nerve-wracking walks you can do in the game because you know you're in constant fear that you'll get pummeled by the ghosts in the next room there's also a portrait ghost that is only able to be caught during the blackout known as uncle grimly he is completely optional but a pretty cool little side mission if you feel like going down there while the blackout doesn't last very long in terms of gameplay, it's pretty impactful because it makes the player feel like all their work thus far has been undone and reset, and it also feels like such a huge pain in the ass as you were just about to enter the next area of the game. Some might call it fluff, some might call it filler, but I call it blackout. Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door already plays around with paranormal and darker themes throughout the game, you know, more so than other RPGs of its kind. It also has crude humor to boot, but it gets a little more dark when you go to the Japanese release of the game and a disturbing death can be seen in Rogue Port. In the starting area of the game, there's a house in which you can enter by going through the back door. In international releases of the game, the room would have scattered papers strewn everywhere, but in the Japanese version, there is a little more added context. We can see a chalk outline of what looks like to be a toad with a blood spatter covering some of the papers behind him. And, you know, this is straight up an active crime scene Mario just stumbled into, and unfortunately it was the ending of that poor toad's life. Likely this was added to show how cruel some of the residents of Rogueport are, or it could have been added as a dark developer gag of some kind, seeing as it isn't exactly in plain sight. You know, after the 15,000th fucking render of Toad you see in the game, you might want to see one get capped, I kinda get it. Whatever the case, Nintendo saw it fit to remove it for international releases, but now we know a Toad has officially been murdered in a gruesome way in a real Mario game. Listen, stay out of Rogueport guys, I heard Luigi got five knuckles shuffled on his way to Podley's Juice Bar. I don't know much about the Spongebob video game lineage beyond Battle for Bikini Bottom, but I do know there are quite a few of them. Spongebob Squarepants Super Sponge for PlayStation 1 is one of the earliest attempts at bringing the yellow sponge to the video game realm. This was a rather unassuming game and likely fell under a lot of people's radars. However, upon the closing of the development office, we were gifted some assets in which revealed a lot of the development process of the game. While this entry isn't exactly creepy or disturbing, it still contains content not suitable for children, so it still counts. In the files of the game, there are some files with a surname Naughty followed by a number. There are three of these images, all of which are just a little too raunchy to show fully on YouTube, but I think you, you can get the idea. At first, I just assumed these were developer doodles that were accidentally left in the game assets, but looking through other files in the game, we can kind of see that developers weren't exactly professional about how they treated the back end. They kind of just used it as a dumping ground for jokes and raunching naming schemes and such. For example, the idea sheet in which devs would write down ideas to be added to the game was deemed SpongeBob shit list which is pretty hilarious to me. This is how me and my boys would handle a project, especially when it's dealing with something like SpongeBob, I mean. But where I think, you know, they might have taken it too far was the image of SpongeBob plowing Patrick in the ass. I, I don't know, it may be just me. Obviously, this was never going to be seen by anyone playing the game, 
but the balls to leave this in a game and expect nobody to sweep the files for it is something else, man. Kids game or not, I don't think anyone really needed to see this BDSM SpongeBot design. The fuck is this? Was this really gonna make it into the final game, guys? Really? Whose sick fantasy is this? I only know Ryan's Toys Kids Review as the kids review channel that, you know, makes blood diamonds worth of money monthly on YouTube. Apparently the guy has a game along with a myriad of other cheap Chinese shit he, you know, his team produces. Listen, I don't hate the kid like many, I feel bad for him. Kinda, but he's also rich, so kinda fuck him. Anyway, in the deep within the files of this cheap, quick-to-market racing game, there's a pretty disturbing image of Ryan himself. We can see facial animations of Ryan where he's happy, sad, and with his eyes closed. However, in the fourth image, we can see that, you know, Ryan might have, you know, taken a turn too quick and ended up in the ER. Stitched eyes, blood seeping out. What happened to my boy, my beautiful baby boy? Yeah, someone got to the accident before the paramedics and decided to try and fix Ryan up himself. Yeah, he just stitched him right back up and boom, brand new. Nah, I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. But yeah, this is an image that is officially in the Ryan Toys Review Kart Racer game. It's a bit odd, but honestly, if I was this third-party game dev getting paid and resealed toys to develop a game, you know, I'd be adding shit like this left and right. You better believe it. You try and consume any little bit of Ryan's toys reviews and tell me you don't think about doodling some something up like this. Shout out to this game dev dude, keeping shit real. I love you. There's something oh so eerie about the 4th and 5th generation console menus that creeped out so many people. If it wasn't the PS2 red screen of death, the other side of the spectrum was getting hit on the head with a piano. Literally. The Nintendo GameCube had the ability to connect to the Game Boy Advance through an accessory known as the Game Boy Player. If there was an error with the Game Boy Player, say you were trying to launch a feature that uses the Game Boy Player and it's not attached, you would be hit with this screen. Not only is it basically a jump scare, but it doesn't help that the message seems urgent with a red background. Like, okay, I, I know I don't have the Game Boy Player connected right now, GameCube, just please let me see my family. This is one of my favorite comments in regards to the screen. It seems like Nintendo put this in to scare kids into waking up their parents in the middle of the night when they're trying to do some midnight gaming. I really don't know why the screen had to be so urgent and sudden and it caused many people to fear the screen. Hey, at least nobody ever forgot to plug in their Game Boy Player again. But now every time I hear a piano, I have a little bit of PTSD. I definitely played Lego Island when I was younger, as this is a core memory of mine. There's no way it's not. I never got that far in the game as a kid, and I think I was really just entranced with the open world aspect, if you could even call it that nowadays. There's a story and objectives in the game, so if you happen to find your way to the ending of the game, there's a bad ending which can occur. You kind of have to really try and get this ending as the game isn't super difficult, but if you don't end up catching Brickster, the enemy in the game, in time, a pretty eerie cutscene will play where it shows Lego Island going to hell in a handbasket and Brickster celebrating with glee. It's chaos in the streets, and it really makes you feel like you fucked up and the villain won. It shows you what happens instead of a simple game over. You know, not many games do this. This was actually even a dialed back version of the cutscene as in the game's files there's an extended one where the main information center can be seen, you know, lit ablaze on fire. This reminds me of the game over screen from Donkey Kong 64 or even Banjo Kazooie where, you know, bad guy triumphant music plays while everything goes to shit. In Donkey Kong 64, Donkey Kong Island is blown to smithereens. You know, in Banjo, your sister gets turned into an orc from Lord of the Rings. And in this game, the island of Lego is taken over by the top criminal mastermind, Brickster. It's defeating and it feels bad, man, but it taught a lot of kids some lessons. And that lesson is don't let fucking Brickster get away, dude. While many wouldn't describe the original Xbox's home screen as disturbing, it would quickly change to that given enough time idling. 
Many games and consoles have small Easter eggs built in if the players leave the consoles or games themselves running, many of which are simple animations or audio cues. However, in the original Xbox's case, things get kind of disturbing. After idling on the main menu for long enough, the sounds that the Xbox starts to make on the main menu turn into weird radio transmission gibberish combined with weird ambient sounds. This is actually sourced from public access NASA clips from an Apollo mission, which is pretty cool. These clips were then tweaked and included in the strange ambient track that was then layered below the main menu of the original Xbox. It's really unknown as to the reason why it was included, but there are some funny stories of people who left their Xboxes on and it's you know, started to play this. I mean, honestly, put yourself in the scenario. It's 2 a.m. You accidentally leave your original Xbox on in the other room. Then suddenly you start hearing radio chatter akin to something you hear during one of the world wars. You're not gonna even think for a second that's not a ghost? Not me, man. If this happened to me, I'd probably move out and take my Xbox with me only to then think a ghost is following me and only appearing in the form of ambient Xbox sounds. Leave my family alone, Xbox ghost. The Mother series is one of the strangest RPG series on the market. I don't, I don't think I'm the first one to say that. Too bad we still haven't gotten that official US port of Mother 3 yet, guys. What's going on over there? Eh? Eh? What's going on? Hey, Chief, what's going on over there? Maybe we'll see a Mario RPG style remake come out one day for it, but I'm not holding my breath. I never played Mother 3, but I've experienced a decent bit of Earthbound, so I am aware of how strange the series can be. In the files of Mother 3, there are some pretty strange and disturbing things that weren't featured in the final game. This is mostly comprised of images, of which were going to be used for battle backgrounds. There's actually a lot that went unused, and thanks to modders, we can even see what they may have looked like moving around in the game itself. There's some strange sprites of the character Klaus, even one where it appears he's fully nude, but the most notable and the most creepy can be found at the bottom of the list. There's an image of a large red blob with beady eyes that to some seems like this game's version of a Gygus type character. However, this was confirmed to be untrue by a developer in an interview. Whatever this character was, he was definitely creepy and on the levels of a Gygus character, albeit a bit more tame. You know, he looks a bit more cartoony than Gygus did. If we do ever get another Mother game, I would love for the dev team to fully lean into the disturbing aspects of these games and make a true horror JRPG classic. Donkey Kong 64 is a game. That's all, folks. Good night. No, it's a game that is good and bad at the same time. Many people don't like this game, but it holds a special place in my heart, and I love it. However, it doesn't come without its disturbing moments. If it's not the threat of King K. Rool blowing up Donkey Kong's big-ass head the whole game, it'll likely be a random moment that happens during the second world of the game. Upon entering Angry Aztec, you'll likely find yourself walking into these large structures akin to pyramids. Once inside, there are usually a small puzzle or maze to navigate, and at the end of the maze, there is a golden banana for you to get. Sounds pretty simple, right? Well, as soon as you pick up the golden banana, a loud voice saying, Get out! can be heard before a reticle and timer appear on the screen. Without any explanation, you are then expected to race out of the same puzzle you just ran through before getting blasted by whatever godly entity whispered into your ear. I always thought it was King K. Rool saying it, and it kind of sounded like the same deep voice that was used for him, but I don't know. It could be someone even scarier than King K. Rool. I'd hope so, because this guy becomes a fucking chump pretty quickly in the end game. Look at this idiot. He gets defeated by titties. Anyway, this is one of the most terrifying things in the game for me as a kid, and it made me want to avoid going into these pyramids and fear that this guy was waiting to tell me to get out, only to fucking blast me in the face with some sort of fucking high-powered high rifle he has. Alright, that wraps up this iceberg. If you'd like to see the actual iceberg, I will have it linked in the description below for you to check out. If you'd like to see my other iceberg videos, there's a playlist located down below as well. Thanks again for watching the video, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.